The Kingdom of Accomac, the indigenous Negro Accomac Indians of Virginia's Eastern Shore. We were the first contact Indians of the Eastern Shore. We covered small parts of what is now Southampton County and also what is now Northampton County, including a small portion of Accomac County. Ours was a kingdom that was related to the Powhatan Confederacy, or to Sanamaco people but independent. We paid tribute to King Powhatan, but signed no treaties. We also were known as part of the Cherokee Nation, original the Ananawea Nation umbrella, but uniquely Accomac. The land of plenty. We live on a peninsula full of resources. We have fish, shellfish, deer, turkey, and many other wondrous creatures. We are great business leaders, conductors of commerce, herbal healers, agriculturalists, inventors, architects, hunters, oceanographers, and conservationists. Accomax put women first. Our tradition was of liberation and equality. Women did most anything they wanted in Accomax culture. Women were the principal organic farmers, herbalists, and women constructed homes. Most significantly, our king called the Laughing King by the Europeans willed the leadership of his entire Accomac kingdom to his daughter. The Accomac Empress was born. The Laughing King married the daughter of King Powhatan, Maida Powhatan. Maida was also the half-sister of Pocahontas. The Laughing King and Maida had several children. One of them was a girl named they called Nardwa. She was to become the princess of the Accomac. Growing up Nandua, many sunrises in the past, Nandua was born of her mother, Meta. Nandua had plenty of love and lessons. Everyone loved and cared for all the children of the Akamak villages. The Akamaks have always placed the highest priority on caring and sharing. For not to have an abundant and generous heart would be a dishonor to God and one's ancestors. Nandua's older sister, Sima, taught her the science of herbology, the love of trees, and how to find valuable cures and remedies. Everyone celebrated each other's beauty and gifts. Nandu appreciated Sima for her gifts, and Sima appreciated Nandua for hers. We all have gifts. Some have many gifts, some have one gift. Some Akimak's gifts were as simple as the gift of listening. But such a gift is well respected amongst the people who love to talk. In many families, the skin tones and sizes and shades were beautiful. Coincidentally, contrary to false history books, the Akamak skin colors have always been various shades of copper brown. The Akamak Indians vary in appearance from darkest chestnut to honey brown, with thick, coarse, long hair and soft, spongy, curly hair. William Strachey wrote a primary source in his book, The History of Travel into Virginia Britannia, written in 1612, describing the Virginia Indians just as we were. Nandua, the beautiful brown Indian princess, enjoyed her life on the shore. She was skilled and fearless as she faced off with various creatures. She spent a lot of time on adventurous hunts with her dad, uncles, and siblings. Many of us practice hunting in this manner today. Nandua spent hours and hours alone with her father, the Laughing King, fishing and hunting. Nandua also loved to cook, sew, and build. The Akamak Indian men and boys could cook as well. The Akamaks were great cooks and still are skilled in the kitchen. The shores had a bounty of resources. Their lives were rich. Unfortunately, the Laughing King predicted that the invasion of the settlers 
would change life on the eastern shores. Not forever, but eventually life would come full circle as shown in the sky. The king's circle would not close for a long time. So the Laughing King had a plan. The plan. The Laughing King had a plan. Indeed, the Laughing King had a plan with various phases. Akamak Nation being on the Eastern Shore Peninsula of Virginia was very vulnerable. The Laughing King knew that English ships could easily invade the Akamaks. Therefore, it was essential that we, the Akamaks, defended ourselves by developing a plan for success. We indigenous Indians respect each other's gifts and strengths. The Laughing King, being a great strategist, knew his brother Kipotepeak was a better warrior. So the king retired to hunt and turned over his crown and leadership to his brother. Notice that the Laughing King did not let his pride keep him from stepping aside for the benefit of his family and his people. True indigenous Indians like the Akamak Indians know the danger of having too much pride and strive to work together for the greatest good. Unfortunately, we the Akamak could not anticipate the fast and furious invasion and oppression that was to come. Being soulful people who live in harmony and peace with nature, we did not understand beings who are driven by greed and who have predatory natures. Contrary to European reports of indigenous American history, the intent behind the arrival of the English was not as merely a peaceful settlement. In fact, primary accounts in books dating back to the 1500s report that there were research and discovery missions that preceded the settlements in Virginia. Such accounts were written by, for example, a scientist named Thomas Harrod and by Captain John Smith. Smith even reported taking indigenous Virginia Indian boys with him to England for training as interpreters and possibly as spies. The mission of the English colonies, A.K. London Company, was that of commercial conquest. It was a hostile takeover of a very old world, a world full of valuable resources, including and especially its resource of indigenous copper colored people. America or Turtle Island may have been new to England, but it was and is a very ancient world. The Europeans came in multiple shiploads and sent the mildest mannered religious representatives to lead the way. North American Indians have a strong faith in God. Worship, faith, and spirituality guided our lives as they do still. The English came ready to discredit our religion and replace it with Christianity as a tool to control us. Eyre Hall Eastfield Plantation's owner's ancestor, Quaker Nathaniel Eyre, was an early settler who used religious manipulation of very spiritual Akamak Indians to acquire 6,000 acres of Akamak Magatha clan land upon 
his arrival. They put up fences in a foreign land. First and foremost, Jamestown and all settlements were forts, military installations. It is inconceivable to think the Europeans had the audacity to invade in a foreign land, put up fences, impose foreign laws, take military action, and claim immediate ownership of another people's homeland. In fact, court records in the Accomac homeland begin as early as 1628. The early court records show even the Laughing King was charged with trespassing while hunting. For as you see, we were no longer free to roam at home. The homeland was filled by other invasions of European debtors and criminals who were forced to travel to America as white slaves and indentured servants of aristocrats. The problem with European slaves is they could and did easily run off and claim to be free immigrants. Consequently, being good-natured and expert tradespeople and agriculturalists, the Accomacs became the best viable source of labor. The question then became how best to make a free Indian into a forever slave to be continued. The plan. The Accomac's first plan was to allow the Lopaltans to commit a series of covert attacks against the European invasion. The Accomac are well known for their skill as herbalists. And the Accomac are the essential herb growers of the Palatins. This skill was also a defense weapon. In fact, we were known to at times facilitate what we refer to as death by dinner parties. The beautiful, dark, copper-colored Indian ladies would put on a delicious, yet highly toxic feast and demolish the enemy. Another covert Indian attack occurred on Good Friday. We Akamak refer to it as Death by Corn Cobs. Akamak Indians are part of the Palatin Confederacy and the Cherokee Nation. Akamak are natural conservationists, so when the Europeans kept demanding more and more food, it was a problem. The indigenous Indians in Virginia became fed up with the European need and need. This demand from the European caused a devastating depletion of the Palatine Indian food stores. Our humor was sharp as a knife in that on one occasion, prior to the War of 1612, we chose to murder them with the instrument of their greed, corn. Corn cobs, corn on the cob to be exact, stuffed down their throats. And we did so on their religious holiday, Good Friday, for a touch of bitter irony. This had limited effect because more and more Europeans kept coming. Many of the colonialists were indentured Europeans who were used as slaves. In addition, the English continued to send ships of soldiers to fight us. Cannons on the shores outgunned the corn cobs. So as a result, the Akamak leaders had to make an alternate plan. Later, when approached by the Pamunkey for a herb to poison the Europeans at Jamestown Fort, the Akamak declined to provide the poison. 
Instead, we in fact sent a young boy to warn James Fort of the intended Pamunkey assault. Notice we refer to Jamestown as a fort. We call it James Fort because it was first and foremost a military installation, not a settlement. Keep in mind also that our decision had to be based on the fact that we were alone on a peninsula and it was very dangerous for the Akamak who planned to survive. And fortunately for us, we did survive as we still exist today. Akamak support of James Fort did not prevent the hostile European takeover. In the early 1600s, Virginia, there were three long, harsh reported Anglo-Indian wars. Actually, also, there were hundreds of never recorded battles, skirmishes, and wars. The prisoners of these wars were turned into what we refer to as slaves. Many of these slaves were transported to Barbados and Bermuda to torture, train, and return to North America for sale. The wars were a battle on one side to remove the Europeans, and conversely it was a struggle on the opposite side to abolish the copper-colored indigenous Indian. As a result of our warring Powhatan kin, the Akamak support of Jamestown did not prevent the Europeans from pushing the Akamak out of our towns and main villages and forcing us into a cruel prison slave camp called Gingaskin Reservation. Via an unlawful act of the Virginia Company, they actually changed our names, the name of our people from Akamak or Akamaki to Gingaskin. And they changed our homeland to Northampton. Established in 1640, Gingaskin Reservation was the first reservation slash slave camp in this nation they now call the United States. They pushed us off of our bayside, beautiful coastal villages that were located on and around Cape Charles, Air Hall, and Smith Beach Road and pushed us to the other side onto Gingaskin Slave Camp slash Reservation. The name Gingaskin, you will see it recorded falsely claimed to mean gin drinking, baggy pants, lazy person. Well, that is absolutely false. There is no such meaning in the English language that actually refers to Gingaskin. In truth, the name Gingaskin is an anagram. It is actually scrambled to disguise the name Nigga Skin, N-I-G-G-A-S-K-I-N. If you study the word Nigga, N-I-G-G-A or N-I-G-A, it's a very old term used to describe dark colored people used to describe specifically Indians, indigenously dark people. This anagram clearly proves that the Akamak were always identified as nigga, even as early as 1640, prior to any possible racial mixing. Some of the Akamaks pushed onto the reservation were also forced into servitude on nearby plantations. War was the first mechanism that created true slavery of the American Indian and the actual slavery that began in the United States was a mechanism of war and importation of white indentured servants. You see, as a direct result of war, Indians were quickly condemned to slavery. This also allowed these copper-colored Indians to be reclassified as Indian servants, slaves, colored Negroes. For you can call your property 
whatever you want. Despite having their identity and land forcibly removed by invaders, the Akamak Indians persevered. War, capture, debt, and law created slavery in Virginia. Yet several Indians were not slaves. Those who escaped capture and removal remained off reservation and free. Very many prospered. The English invasion began as a trade permit. The English were given permission to conduct business on Turtle Island. Export, import, and commerce was the plan. America was and is an old ancient world, not a new world to settle and take over. American Indians of the western, southern, and eastern seaboard were um, world travelers. They traveled the globe and have been conducting trade for thousands of years. They had roads and trails which crisscrossed this country. They had all types of architecture, homes of stucco, wood, log, and brick. They had towns that were big and small with all kinds of European imports. They had storehouses with dried and preserved produce, domesticated livestock. They had sauna systems, sewage management systems, water conduit systems, and metalworks. The truth is, the English invasion was desired by some of the Afro-American Dark Indians as a new opportunity for commerce. There were dark copper-colored Indians who hoped to profit from their new temporary English tenants. From the very beginning, in the early 1600s, several Akamak Indians like Anthony Johnson succeeded in profiting as plantation owners and exporters. Anthony Johnson was not from Africa. He was absolutely Akamak Indian. Free, successful, dark-skinned, copper-colored Indians did exist on the eastern shore of Virginia. Akamak Homeland, Northampton, on the eastern shore has, in fact, the most recorded free people of color, not imported Africans, but were free, dark-skinned, Afro-American Indians conducting business as planned. The success of the Akamak Afro-American and dark Indians in commerce predates English arrival. The story of opportunity in a free new world is a false history told in many books to hide the truth about the theft of this country. Yet the original idea was mutually beneficial commerce with the, with the English, but the Indians did not think the English would stay. Unfortunately, this the highly weaponized English came and dumped their enslaved European poor and criminals on American soil. Indian Anglo Wars began in the 1600s and quickly and especially after the Indians noted the cannons arrival and the English building forts. It was apparent the English camp had turned into a hostile takeover. War, capture, export to Bermuda and Barbados, and import back into North America along with debt, imprisonment, slave code laws, they all created slavery in Virginia and in the Americas. In the beginning, the Indian slaves helped the European slaves often helping them to escape. In response, the colonialist government developed its biggest weapon, colorism. Labeling European slaves white 
and Indian slaves black or Negro, then pitting them against each other and giving one benefits or favor over the other. Showing benefits or favor to the white slave, this forever divided the new friends. Most significantly, the colonialist European government developed the identity theft war tactic. The identity theft war tactic changed free dark Afro-American Indians into Negroes and Blacks via laws. The European colonialists used Virginia slave codes to completely reclassify the Afro-American dark Indian into non-identified people without ties to their own Virginia indigenous soil. Being called Negro and Black caused them to lose their rights and their lands. Today, many Afro-American Dark Indians are now identified as African American. These African Americans have been systematically misled due to the identity theft war tactic. They have been misled and do not know their identities. Fortunately, the Akamak know their true place, identity, and their rights in their Virginia homeland. Despite the prejudice in America against the so-called African Americans, there's a large number of immigrants from Africa, Ghana, Nigeria largely, Ethiopia, Somalia, you name it. They, are, they seem to be welcome in this very prejudiced place against Negroid looking people. It doesn't make sense. However, when you look at the fact that this place has a history of such prejudice towards their own American, African Americans, why do they welcome foreign immigrants? Well, despite the prejudice, they are here. And now there is a first generation of immigrant new African-American adult children in America. Immigrant African-Americans are here and given the same name as our misled African-Americans. Now, the unfortunate Afro-American dark Indians who have been misled and believe that they are from actual Africa when in actuality they are just misclassified Indians are bound to be swept into a sea of African Americans to be forever lost. The identity theft tactic works. It will make these people lose their rights and ties to the land and be swept into a classification along with foreign immigrants. It's being used along with misleading DNA reports to deeply convince Afro-American dark Indians that they come from Africa and that they are indeed on foreign soil in America and have no real indigenous rights in this country. Hopefully more black identity thick victims or so-called African Americans will research their genealogy and history while looking toward the homeland of their American Negro ancestors. If the genealogy and land records points to their being from America and not Africa, they need to reconsider and next search for the Indians that inhabited their forefathers and foremothers' homelands. Because here, may need, they need to learn about their own people and find the true indigenous American Indian people to which they belong. They should also read books about those Indians and maps to find out who exactly they are, 
where they were and who the people are that they are connected to. FYI, slave ships logs do not necessarily, necessarily mean you are from Africa. Slave ships transported American Indians to the islands from England, from to Virginia, from Virginia to Florida, Louisiana, back and forth and forth and back. And also, ships took many Afro-Indians to Europe and even took American, dark American Afro-Indians to Africa. So truly, the black identity theft victim Americans referred to wrongly as African American need to do their research. Now, back to the Akamax. The Revolutionary War of 1776 was not the fight for American independence, you believe, not merely a fight to be free from England's tariffs, taxation, and limitations. It was a bloody, greedy fight for invading European defectors and deviants to take over America. Oh, they were here to take over the homeland that belonged to the Afro-American dark Indian people. The new self-proclaimed revolutionary European Americans sought to assume the identity of the true copper-colored Indians in still vast country. If you look at history, it has been done all over the world and repeatedly. Just look to Hawaii. The first thing the colonialists did was ask the queen to make them native Hawaiians. The next thing you know, they made her, they banished her, made her step down, destroyed her. And they made it with the natives until now they are pretty much unrecognizable as the dark indigenous Hawaiians that were there and that was as recent as the late 1800s early 1900s you, you so you see how quickly the identity theft can occur for the indigenous afro-american dark Indians it was a pivotal point of no return towards slavery confusion oppression terrorism, bondage, and continuous warpath upon them on their own soil. Post-Revolutionary War, the new European Americans did not hesitate to exercise their greed and do just the opposite as England had advised and just immediately expanded all over the country, taking up all masses of indigenous territory. Their first mission was the Western Plains. Understand that the Western Plains contains and contained Native American Indians, mainly of Siberian Asian origins, who were absolutely unknown to the European colonialists until they were guided to the Great Plains post Louisiana purchase by the dark Indian Sacagawea and her husband in 1806. So you see for 200 years the Afro-American dark Indians fought, farmed, struggled and built while the Native Americans of Siberian ancestry lived in the plains unbothered for 200 years. The Western Plains Indians, unless they had migrated to mix with the dark Afro-Indians, did not fight in the Revolutionary War or the Civil War. The Western Plains Indians are clearly not the same as the indigenous Afro-American dark Indians. They are and they were and still are completely different people with different lifestyles and ways. The post-revolutionary invaders land greed led to the bloody war of 1812 which actually the greed that they were feeling extended even to the eastern shore. 
In fact, the Virginia Assembly and Virginia settlers in 1813 demanded possession of what was left of the Accomac Indian Reservation land. That is, in addition to the fact that they had already taken the entire country, including the entire eastern shore. The Virginia Assembly had the audacity to claim that the eternally and always Afro-American dark Indians in appearance looked as they always did because they were mixed and married to blacks of unknown or African origin. In truth, our Akamak Indian ancestry does contain various European ancestors, some European whites, but also some European black ancestors. On the eastern shore, the Akamak have no verified ancestry that comes from Africa. Only black Europeans and white Europeans. As a matter of fact, the governor of Virginia clearly stated in the 1700s, 1708, that it was rare to see a ship, that a Negro ship on those on the shores. That in that Negroes that came would have come from Barbados. Okay, so with that being the case, they had the audacity to claim that. People who had no verified African ancestry were no longer Indian. So the Virginia Assembly made this made this statement knowing good and well that back in the early 1600s when the reservation was created, the Akamak people were renamed along with the reservation. They renamed the people in the reservation Ginga Skin which is an anagram for nigga skin. How could a people use such a revealing and derogatory term as nigga skin and keep the evidence right in the names of the people who they are now saying are not Negroid in appearance when it is extremely apparent by the name given in an anagram that they always noticed and knew the Akamaks have Negroid appearances. For almost 200 years, they secretly referred to the Akamak Indians niggaskins by calling them gengaskins. A little later, in 1831, the Nat Turner Uprising was truly the last Indian War. Nat is a known indigenous Indian name and Nat Turner is a known Afro-American dark Indian associated with both the Nottawa Indians and the Akamaks. Nat Indian War set the tone. It set fire to hate and terrorism against all Indians and the Virginia Assembly as a result took the Gingaskin Reservation away from the Akamaks. Loss of land brought poverty to many families. The Nat Turner War also beckoned on the Trail of Tears. The Trail of Tears was another mechanism meant to divide and separate Afro-American dark Indian families and establish the false, false superiority of the government sanctioned new Native Americans. The Trail of Tears was used to ensure that Afro-American Dark Indians would never come together to war again. The Trail of Tears was done to protect the economic powerhouse of the European American Corporation. During the 1800s, the war tactic of identity theft was used once again. It was used to replace the identity of the chiefs of all the major tribes in America. The previously very dark colored Afro-American Indian chiefs were replaced with new or Native American Indian chiefs. These chiefs were like John Ross, 
New Design, Native American Chief of the Cherokee Indians. John Ross, in the uh, 1800s, was predominantly Scottish and spoke no Cherokee. The chief substitution sealed the new image of the now new Native Americans and banished the authentic dark Afro-American Indians. The war tactic of identity theft was again used in the mid-1800s at the same time in California in the Midwest during the gold rush and the railroad system development. At that time, the Midwest instituted, especially California, laws permitting Chinese to reclassify as Native American. This was chiefly done to make it impossible for the Chinese to testify against whites in courts, but it also enabled the Chinese to actually reclassify themselves as Native Americans. Um, Chinese new Native American admixture has made today's Native Americans appear more Asian today than did Sitting Bull and his contemporaries. The Akamak Indians remained on the shore and they fought the Civil War looking for justice and they did not find it. They did work and work and and went to school and struggled and achieved and rebuilt despite any opposition but again in the 1900s early 1900s another installation of the war tactic of American identity in American Indian identity theft was used in the administration of the Census Bureau Walter Plecker, director of the Census Bureau, who meticulously reclassified Indians from birth to death, even threatening midwives. He made sure any brown babies, no matter how they classified themselves, were classified again and changed to black or negro, regardless of what their heritage or status might be. At that time also, it beckoned in World War I in, in 1914-1950s. Imagine coming home at that time, having your rights as an Indian taken away from you, even though it's on your draft card, it's on your registration card that you're Indian, okay? Being lynched, being burnt out, being threatened and terrorized. And at the same time, there was a film release by a Christian minister in, of all places, Cape Charles, Virginia, right in Accomack country. Birth of a Nation was funded by Boston Jewish businessmen who used the funds of hate to create what? MGM Studios. The riots and destruction of, of hundreds of black Wall Streets in America closely correlate to the showing of Birth of a Nation. A birth of a nation ran in a theater for two years, sometimes longer, depending where you were located. It led to rapes, murders, burnings, lynchings, loss of property, loss of land. Imagine coming home on the Eastern Shore after fighting war and having great fans of the writer and friends of the writer of such a hateful movie right there on the Eastern Shore. In addition, the best friend of the writer of Birth of the Nation, also known as the book The Klansman, Thomas Dixon Jr., his best friend was Woodrow Wilson, Democratic president, who ran a campaign to, to, to take the Negroes away from the, Dem the Republican Party, promising to help the Negro. But instead, he created segregation in America. He is the father of Jim Crow. Woodrow Wilson, liberal Democrat and friend and, and fake friend to the Negro, created segregation of the railroad cars and the postal employees. He created hate and division in the workplace. Well, next came World War II and the Great Depression, hard on the entire country. But imagine, along with that, you have hate, 
terrorism, destruction of businesses, racial racial attacks, economic oppression. Imagine this happening from invaders on your own indigenous soil that you're even afraid to admit that it is. In the 1950s, in addition to the terrorism, the Northampton descendants of the wealthy plantation families intentionally blocked businesses developing or industries from coming to the shore. No employer opportunities for the people of the shore. The Europeans so determined to stop the Akamek from rebuilding that they even denied their own families opportunities. Another trail of tears is the Great Migration. It is another trail of tears. They moved to New Jersey, New York, Maryland, Delaware, Pennsylvania, etc. The Akamex helped each other. They helped each other find homes and jobs. They cared deeply about each other. That's the way Akamex care. However, the very, very best of the Akamex Indians remained on the eastern shore in Northampton, Akamex County, parts of, of, of Southampton, and they dealt face to face with the oppression and hate. And they did so with a smile, a very friendly smile. Still misclassified, still hiding in plain sight. The majority of those who migrated have two parents and four great grand or four grandparents tied to the eastern shore and can chase their lineage pre-colonial. The Akamaks they connected and continuously maintained their culture and history with the Eastern Shore home. If you think you're Akamak Indian, look them up on Facebook or at the, we the website akamak.org. At this very moment, descendants of European settlers have occupied the main Akamak village of our king since the, 19 since the 1700s and continue to hold this sacred Akamak land captive as Air Hall Plantation. In addition, Indian Town Park in Eastville is on and dedicated to what remains of the Akamak Gingaskin Reservation and it is being held by the County of Northampton. We Akamak supporters across the globe manifest that the Indian Town Park will soon become the new Akamak Historical and Agricultural Conservation and Wildlife Preservation Center. Today the Akamak are returning and maintain their unity as they share their culture and hope for restoration and opportunities for everyone on the Eastern Shore very soon. So we would like to encourage you to write letters of support of restoration of the stolen lands. Write Air Hall Plantation, Northampton Park, uh, Parks and Rec Recreation Department's Director, the Virginia Assembly, the Virginia Governor, Senators, Delegates, and the President. If you're interested in supporting the Akamak as, as they restore, please contact them at their website, akamak.org. Don't forget, you can use Twitter and contact these people too. And please, thank you for your support.